It's 11 o'clock on Wednesday, the 3rd of November, 2021. So a warm welcome to today's presentation from U3A Helderberg, which will be the last one of our monthly talks for 2021. Good morning to you all from here in Somerset West, especially our non-U3A Helderberg visitors. I'm Richard Tompkins, your host for the presentation. Again, we have thanks to our studio director today, Jeff Burton, who is coordinating proceedings. We're presenting these talks on YouTube. As a reminder, we cannot see or hear you, but there's a live chat area on the right-hand side of your screen where questions to the speaker can be typed during the presentation. Jeff will select those of your questions that could be of general interest to all and show them centrally on everyone's screen. The full presentation today is being recorded and will be available along with previous ones from 2021 on our website u3helderberg.co.za. Now I'd like to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Jennifer Thompson, who is Emeritus Professor at the Department of Molecular and Cell Biology in the University of Cape Town. Her topic today is Genetically Modified Crops and the Global Divide, which is also the title of her latest book on this controversial subject. Hopefully we can all be educated and enlightened, especially during these times of questioning agricultural land title and utilization and therefore food security. Needless to say, an increasing world population, especially in Africa, does not help this security as it demands food from much the same topographical area of arable land. A suggested possible way of increasing food production, we shall now see. And on that note, over to Professor Jennifer Thompson. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm delighted to be with you all, and uh, the topic of my talk today is uh, GM crops, genetically modified crops, and the global divide. Uh, my original topic was uh, the original title of my book. Um, sorry, let me just get to the... Oopsie. Uh, sorry about that. Um, the original topic for my book was GM crops, the West versus the rest. But uh, my publishers thought that that might be a little bit controversial. So um, as you will see, from, oh, this is the, the, the book, GM crops and the global divide. It's um, published both by the Australian uh, CSIRO Press and by CABI, which is a biotechnology uh, publishing company in the UK. And you can also get it on uh, Amazon and on Kindle. Um, this is an overview of my presentation. I'm going to start with the question of what is a developed country and what is a developing country? And then going on to this question of what is the West and what is the rest and why does the West have a particular stand on GM crops. And then I'm going to look at some of the GM crops made in Africa for Africa by Africans. Uh, then I'm going to talk about learning from economists and very, very importantly, how to bust myths and how to communicate. And I'll end off with some conclusions. Um, sorry. Uh, so, talking about developed and developing, I have to tell you that while I was uh, talking about writing this book to some, with some friends, their 15-year-old daughter, Sophie, stopped me while I was talking and said, Jen, you've got to read this book called Factfulness. And at the bottom, you can see that the book Factfulness is, uh, is written by a person called Rosling. And um, what that book goes into is what really is the difference between a developed and a developing country? After all, take Canada. We would always call Canada a developed country. But if it's not still developing, then it's retrogressing. So you start thinking in a different way if you look at this book, Factfulness. And instead of talking about West and rest, uh, West, the West and the rest, and um, how uh, successful a country is, he, the, the author has levels one to four, depending on how much that per, an average person in that country would earn per, per day. 
I'm not going to go into this, but I'm just wanting to point out that it's just not uh, straightforward talking about developed and developing in the West and the rest. Um, in my the, the one book I wrote before this was called Food for Africa, which was a bit of a presumptuous book, a title, but my publisher at the time thought it was good. At, any rate, at, the, at one stage towards the end, I wrote the bridge across the agricultural genetic divide needs to be crossed. And that's what I'm doing in this book. I'm trying to bridge the agricultural genetic divide that is the West versus the rest, the developed versus the developed, or however you'd like to talk about it. So let's look at my next topic, which is the West stand on GM crops. Now, the West, and of course, we're really talking about uh, America, Canada, and Europe, maybe a few others. Any anyway, rate, in a way, it began as a trade war because it began in America and the EU, the European Union, um, wasn't uh, up to speed yet, and they wanted to keep GM crops, which were burgeoning in in, Africa, in, in American uh, farms, from swamping the Europeans. So it's potentially a, a, it was a trade war. Another problem that uh, we find in the Europe, in European countries, is that of course Monsanto was a very big player in the early days of genetically modified crops in America. And because American farmers had accepted it so very quickly, uh, Monsanto and then later other uh, multinationals in that same field just assumed that everybody else would have accepted it. And it was rather arrogant. And that really did play uh, badly into the acceptance. Also, if you look at the anti-GMO lobby, I mean, they always were saying bad news, bad news. And bad news helps to sell new newspapers. Bad news grabs the attention. And then, of course, Greenpeace took the opportunity. Uh, they were looking for increased funding. Um, they always are, as are many um, uh, uh, non-profit organizations looking for funding. But one of their uh, act, active uh, uh, agents in the, Euro, in the UK was a guy called Mark Linus. And he was busy, as Greenpeace was, in destroying fields that were being tested and really uh, playing havoc with scientists' work when it came to testing it in the field. And uh, Mark Linus was is a um, a journalist, a freelance journalist, and he was re reading um, the various uh, journals that were put out by scientific societies, and he decided to look at some of the journal articles on GM crops, and he thought, "Oh my lord, I have I've actually got it wrong," and he made a complete change around 180 degrees and and wrote a book called Seeds of Science: How We Got It So Wrong on GMOs. So I, I recommend that as another book to, to look at, from somebody who was totally anti to now somebody who's totally pro. Um, I must also uh, explain that the more knowledgeable you are does not necessarily mean that you accept uh, the, the uh, GM crops. Uh, and I often used to go to the European Union in the early days and, and talk to uh, people in that organization. And eventually they admitted that their policy was not based on science. It was based on politics. Now, why is the EU, the stance that the EU takes, why does it influence African so much? And why does it influence the African acceptance of GM crops? Well, first of all, in Africa, most leaders in Africa follow the EU, which doesn't accept GM crops, and not the US, which does accept it on the whole. And partly the reasons are foreign aid. The EU gives much more aid to Africa than does America. Policy makers in Africa have closer ties to the EU. And many of the agricultural exports in Africa go up straight up to the EU. And the EU stand, as I've said, is not based on um, science. It's based on risks, not benefits. And it talks about the difference between farmers and consumers and says, you know, GM crops are to help farmers, they're not to help consumers. But if you look at Africa, 
many of African farmers are also the consumers because so many of African farmers are smallholder farmers. And so they, uh, that what they produce is consumed by their families and their, their neighbors. But then a very interesting thing happened. Mad cow disease happened. Before mad cow um, disease, uh, farmers in, in the EU used to be able to take offal from the abattoirs and feed it to their chickens or their cows or whatever it was. But when it was shown in mad cow disease that a virus could swap, could go from a cow or an animal to humans, we know a lot more about it, uh, of course, now, um, then they realized that they they couldn't use anything from the um, abattoirs anymore as feed for their animals. And so they had to use plant products. And so they wanted maize and they wanted soybeans. But they wouldn't allow their farmers to grow GM um, far, uh, maize or uh, soybeans. And so they didn't grow enough. So they had to import maize and soybeans from the Amer from America, from Canada, from Brazil, and from Argentina. And most of those countries was almost 100% uh, GM. So here is the EU importing GM maize and soybean for their farmers to feed their animals, but they wouldn't allow their farmers themselves to plant them, to grow them. It is, can you see the logic in that? Of course, there's no logic. It's just politics. And if we look at the developed and the developing world perspective, the developed world will say, they used to say to me often when I used to go and talk there, they said, but the world's got enough food. We don't need GM crops or food. And the world produces enough food to, fire, to feed its entire population, which of course is true unless you look at the developing world's perspective. And we're desperately short of food. We need anything that can increase food availability. And we don't have access to all the world's food due to poor physical infrastructure, things like wars and uh, various other small problems. So the perspectives of these two uh, different uh, sectors in society are very different. Now I'm going to talk to you a little bit about my chapter that says countries that got it right and why. Unfortunately, I, my book's a little long for uh, discussing in one lecture, so I'm just talking about a couple of them countries, and one of them is South Africa. South Africa has had commercial plantings of GM crops since 2000. And at the moment, white maize, which is now stacked BT stands for insect resistance. I won't explain to you why. HT stands for herbicide tolerant. So white maize and yellow maize both have stacked traits. So they are both insect resistant and herbicide tolerant. Soybeans, 90% in South Africa. Cotton, 95%, but it's not a very big crop. Um, and a colleague of mine, uh, by the name of Dr. Hose, who works at the University of Pretoria, has done quite a lot of studies looking at smallholder farmers in South Africa growing GM crops. And without GM crops, um, which are uh, herbicide resistant, therefore you don't have, you could spray and kill weeds, the farmers would do, spend uh, so much time, so many hours weeding. With GM maize, they save approximately half of this manual labor. And of course, the manual labor is mainly women. And women can now spend more time caring for children, growing vegetables. And weed resistance and insect resistance have less labor on spraying and more on harvesting. So these two traits have a great deal of, make a great deal of sense to smallholder farmers as well as commercial farmers in South Africa. Um, now let's look at GM crops made in Africa for Africa by Africans. And again, I've had to cut it rather short. Um, in my lab, one of the first uh, GM crops we worked on was maize streak virus, which is not such a problem in South Africa, but the further north you go through Zimbabwe and into East Africa, it's a huge problem. And you can see why it's called maize streak virus because of the streaks, but you're going to get huge amounts of, of loss, both to, and this is a smallholder farmer that I actually photographed in, in, in uh, just outside Nairobi, and he's not going to get much of a crop, both to maize streak virus and to drought and I'm going to talk about drought just now. 
So here are the GMAs that we developed in, in our lab. And you can see that this plant is beautifully resistant. And at the bottom, there's a non-GM plant that's it's, it's hardly even getting off the, the ground. It's so battered by the virus. Now, we published this um, uh, uh, this work, and I'll read it to you. May streak virus resistant transgenic maize are first for Africa. And it was picked up by the journal Science, if you can see at the bottom, and it says uh, in the uh, below the heading, it says the first genetically modified crop developed entirely in Africa is gearing up for field trials. Its success would be a milestone. And look at the bottom. The date is 2007. Ladies and gentlemen, I have to say that we have never done um, field trials on this crop. Why? Because it's so expensive. At the time that we were working on this, and the time that this uh, article was published, we were working with a small seed company called Pana, uh, which is in uh, KwaZulu-Natal. And when we told them that we wanted to commercialize, they said, well, we just don't have the money. We're a small seed company. And the anti-GMO lobby have made it so uh, expensive to do all the trials because the GMO lobby says, you know, this is terribly dangerous. We've got to do it in 25 different farms in 60 different regions and under all different conditions. And it takes about five years of all these trials before you can bring a crop to 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 market. And quite understandably, Panar didn't have that sort of money. Then they were taken over some years later by Pioneer, which is a big multinational seed company. So my colleagues and I approached them and they said, no, this uh, we, we still can't afford to do the field trials because this is only a disease that's found in Africa. And African farmers are too poor to even pay any type of um, um, uh, seed price that's going to in able us to recoup our expenses. And so, unfortunately, virus, maize streak virus resistant maize sits in the, in the deep freeze at UCT and at PANA, and it has never seen the light of day. However, we then went on to work on drought tolerance. Um, I say we, and, and the, the we is written at the bottom there, my colleagues and I. Um, in order to develop a, a, a trait like drought tolerance, you need to get the genes from somewhere. And so um, with the uh, help of some of our physiological friends, we decided to work on these crops called resurrection plants. Now, if you look at the one on the bottom left there, when it's hydrated, it looks green and lovely. But if it's dehydrated, it looks totally dead. It loses all its, its chlorophyll. But if you add, and it can stay like that in its desiccated state for months on end. And if you add water to the dehydrated one, it can swap back to the hydrated one in 72 hours. It's, it's a miraculous resurrection plant. So we took genes from that plant. In order to do this, we had to find the plants um, because they, uh, one of my former postdocs, uh, uh, formed, uh, well, she took over, she and her husband took over a indigenous seed company. And I went to her, Rachel, and I said, uh, do you know this plant? It's called Zero Fighter Viscosa. She says, yes, it's it's in our in our um, catalog, but nobody's ever bought it because they only flower for two days a, a year. And up on the top left, you could see two little flowers. Um, and they grow in cracks in rocks far from, from water. Um, and so they can dehydrate quite considerably. And Rachel said, climb up into the Drakensberg. You can see us uh, on the at a break there. But you can see behind us all these resurrection plants growing out of cracks in rocks. And we took these back to the lab and uh, took genes out of them. And our the, the plant that we use as our sort of uh, workhorse in the lab for genetically engineered is actually the is tobacco. You can see tobacco here. We've got, uh, when we introduce uh, plant, uh, genes into plants, we call them transgenics because we've transferred genes into them. And you can see here, we've got some of our genes in these, uh, in the transgenics and the, the controls. And if you don't give them water, the transgenics, the GM1s go fine and the controls die. 
and uh, there are some in in different uh, later generations we've been extremely lucky oopsie I did, haven't got it there. Um, we've been extremely lucky. Oh, it's, it's written at the bottom. The Department of Science and Innovation has given us 12 million rand to take these transgenic maize plants to glasshouse trials to see whether these uh, plants will actually work. And if they do work, then into uh, field trials. And that's where we're at at the moment. So at least we are fortunate in that the government is very supportive of this type of experimentation. Now, we've got to learn from economists. I'm not an economist and I make no bones about it, but uh, we've got to learn from them as to what makes agricultural economic sense. So, some of the global benefits, and it's uh, this is a publication by Brooks and Barfoot. They put out annual publications on global benefits, on whether it's good for the environment, etc. And in 2016, they came out with the information that the income benefit um, of 18.2 billion um, was uh, uh, due to GM uh, crops, the soybean, maize, canola, and cotton that they were looking at, and it added 4.5% to the global value of these crops. And interestingly enough, it's not just developed countries like America, Brazil, Argentina, and Canada, but 55% of the farm income benefits worldwide were earned by farmers in developing countries. And very importantly, here I've written it in red, with climate change, we're going to have less and less arable land. And we're allowing, this technology allows farmers to produce more without needing to use additional land. And in that uh, publication, they said that without GM crops, we would need to plant additional land equivalent to the combined area of Bangladesh and Sri Lanka in order to get the same amount of food. Um, and, and here I have to say, I said I'm not an economist, but this paper by Vesla et al., I'm one of the co-authors because um, they looked at the um, economic costs of not using GM crops over a very various periods. And in Africa, you can see $2.5 billion were lost in that period, 2008 to 2013. Australia, similarly, just for canola, $380 million. In India... Um, 200 million for golden rice. Golden rice, I'm not going to be able to talk to it, but it's vitamin A enriched rice. So very importantly is the question of how to bust myths and how to communicate. Um, I got this slide from a friend many years ago, and, and when I tried to publish it in the, in the book and tried to get permission from Greenpeace to, to publish this slide, um, they said, no, we don't have that. But uh, you can see it certainly was earlier on. Because this is, I say misinformation, but actually there's a difference between misinformation and disinformation. And this is a kind of disinformation. It, mis misinformation can be a mistake. Disinformation is deliberate, and this is a deliberate um, piece of misinformation. And here it's saying that if you are a bride, you will have no child because GM food will make us infertile. I hate to say what that must make uh, people, in certainly in Africa, feel. If you eat this, if you eat any GM um, a crop, you or food derived from the crop, you will become sterile. Now, that is absolutely outrageous to make statements like that. And you can see there's another um, situation here, caution, GM cause, food can cause infertility. You can't go around spreading things like that because it's very difficult to grab an, a headline back. Once a headline is stuck in people's minds, you cannot reverse it. So what does good communication require? First of all, it requires trust. You've got to communicate both with the heads and with the hearts. Earlier on, I said that more information doesn't necessarily make people accept a particular technology. You've got to know, not only accept the facts, but you've got to understand it with your heart. What do the people fear? 
So what I try to do when I have a, a live audience, I try to say to them, what is it that you fear? Because very often when you do that, you can address those problems directly. For instance, it's not natural. Now, my answer to that is, how many of you like things like ruby grapefruit or seedless grapes? Those are not the product of genetic engineering or genetic modification. Those have come about by either irradiation, by various types of gamma irradiation or chemical uses. And those two, either the irradiation or those chemicals damage the DNA randomly. GM crops, we take a particular gene and insert it. But with irradiation or chemical use, they just hammer the entire genetic material of a crop. Uh, it's usually they do it with a seed. And then they just plant the seeds and they look for the trait they're looking for. They're looking for ruby grapefruit. They're looking for seedless grapes. They're looking for whatever it is. And as they look and they discard the ones that simply are stunted, the ones that don't produce seeds. So the ones that have damaged the rest of the gene genetic material, but they don't know what. Ladies and gentlemen, these crops are not regulated at all. So you, if you, I'm not saying stop eating ruby grapefruits and stop eating seedless grapes. I'm just saying that there seems to be a dual standard here. You can hammer the genome, get what you want, and give it to, to consumers without any testing at all, just that they either like you either like it or you don't. Um, so what is natural when it comes to this? And I would certainly, uh, for myself, I'd rather eat a GM product than a, an irradiated or chemically uh, induced changes, mutations. Then the other thing that they often say is, oh, these poor farmers have to buy seed every year. Those of you who know about hybrids will realize that if you are planting hybrids, whether it's petunias or it's maize or it's whatever else, if you take the seeds and plant the seeds of those hybrids, you're going to not get true reflection of what the actual hybrid is. Because in order to produce a hybrid, you have to cross a given male line and a given female that have been a line that have been tested so that the progeny, the hybrids, produce hybrid vigor, as we often call it. It's a very often increased yields for crops, but it could be blue and white striped petunias. Um, and when hybrids came in in the 1930s, they were treated just as GM crops are. That fa the farmer said, I don't want this, these hybrids. And then there was a drought. And only the hybrids survived. So then they realized, okay, hybrids aren't so bad after all. So farmers have been buying hybrid seeds when they are available, but farmers don't have to. Farmers can. Farmers are savvy. If the hybrids don't make economic sense, they're too expensive for the yield, then they don't have to do it. Um, monocultures, it's quite interesting that uh, because it's much easier to introduce a foreign gene into a number of different varieties of, say, um, rice in, in India, we've got GM in about, I don't know, the last count was about 500 different varieties. So you don't have to have monocultures of a particular crop because you can make GM into, make GM out of many different varieties. Then they talk about super weeds because you can get a, a maize that's resistant to herbicide and you can just um, spray whenever you like. It can use, could result in misuse. So farmers can overuse a herbicide and so the weeds can become resistant to that particular herbicide. And then you have to use another herbicide. But Ladies and gentlemen, we all know about drug-resistant tuberculosis. Certainly where I come from in the Western Cape, it is, um, it is very high in the, this multi-drug-resistant tuberculosis because of doctors over-prescribing antibiotics. And now we've got to the stage where almost no antibiotic will work on some varieties of TB. But with maize, 
they become resistant to a particular herbicide and you can use another one. Not that I am um, suggesting that this is a good idea. That's why when farmers use uh, herbicide tolerant crops, they are instructed as to not overuse the, uh, the, the herbicide. But like with all um, new technologies, there is misuse. It's not a danger of the technology. It's a danger of the misuse. Just like cars aren't dangerous, just drivers are dangerous. Then could they cause cancer? Um, I'm starting to run out of time, so I, I want to move on a bit. But um, certainly there is absolutely no evidence that uh, cancer uh, is caused by GM maize or GM crops in general. Uh, unfortunately, there was a farmer, I mean, a scientist in, um, in France who hit the headlines and it hit the headlines in the Cape Times. And I was asked to speak on this topic of GM crops cause cancer. And the thing is that um, the, the, it, it was to do with uh, the use of uh, herbicides and you'd have to drink the herbicide in order to get cancer. The level of spraying with a particular herbicide, in this case it was Roundup, and in you'd have to drink Roundup in order to get any cause of problem of cancer. So unfortunately what is, is often un misunderstood is that in a scientific trial with small amounts in a, in a given area and a given crop in a lab, you could induce damage to DNA. But you've got to talk about the levels, the amounts that are required. And that is, is often forgotten. And one lab will show that a small amount will cause it in a small uh, 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 plot of, of, of seed. And they, they don't realize that you've got to actually almost drink this. And then there were the questions of farmer suicides in India. Well, the farmer suicides uh, have been there because farmers get into debt and they kill themselves. It's, a, it's, it's sort of something that's happened in, in that part of the world, but long before GM crops came about. And where the farmer suicides are not necessarily where the GM crops are being, are being uh, grown. So there is absolutely no, there are farmer suicides in India, but they are not linked to GM um, rice. The other thing is that there is only, that this is only for commercial farmers. And as I've shown earlier, smallholder farmers can benefit directly. But as I say at the bottom, good communication must address the fears. And uh, I often go into a, a, a a group of people that I'm talking to and I'll say, look, I'm a scientist, but I'm not an economist. So if you've got questions on eco economy, I'll do my best, but don't think that I'm the, I can answer everything. And immediately people understand that, you know, this person doesn't know everything. And it's important to be able to, to differentiate that. And let's the facts speak for themselves. This is an organization that puts out, um, it's at the bottom right, it's called ISAAA, and this is a fairly old one in 2017. Um, and what this organization does, it gets a, an, uh, the data from all the different countries that are growing biotech crops, GM crops. And this is from 1996 when they started to 2017. And it's looking at both industrial and developing countries in um, either million of hectares or in um, million of acres. But here it's done in million of hectares. And you can see that total amount from 1996 to 2017 is 189.8 million hectares that have been developed just using this technology. This is the fastest agricultural technology, the fastest uptake of any technology, whether it's uh, um, mechanization or it's drip irrigation or whatever it is. This is the single most rapidly uh, uh, taken up uh, technology in agriculture. And we can see in blue is the, are the industrial countries. They are tapering off because when you've got 100% of your crop in uh, in Argentina, uh, GM uh, um, 
uh, soybean, you can't really go anywhere, anywhere further. But what is in, increasing are the number of developing countries that are taking it up. And so even a few years ago, the number of um, developing countries uh, increased uh, over that of uh, industrial countries, or rather the, the total hectares planted. So now, finally, I want to come to my conclusions. I hope you agree that the benefits outweigh the potential drawbacks, specifically when we look at other types of interventions that people might try. Success is not instantaneous. That is something that we've got to understand with anything agricultural. It takes a while for this the success to, to come about. So it takes a while for the crops to um, give the full benefit. I'm not saying we don't need regulations. What we need are government support for sensible regulations. And I must say the South African government has done very well in this respect. So we do need sensible re regulations. We need sensible regulations that allow local seed companies like Pana in KZN to afford them. We can't just have regulations that are so expensive that it's only the multinationals. And, and here there's a bit of a um, illogicality in, in the attitude of the anti-GMO lobby. They have pushed for more and more regulations and that have, they have pushed out the small seed companies and it's only the multinationals that can afford it. And then they turn around and say, but it's only the multinationals that are producing these crops and it's not the small seed companies like Panel. You can't have it both ways. We also need government support for research. Now, I can tell you quite uh, from my own experience that because the EU has clamped down so much on the ability of scientists to see the, prof their, their, the crops that they produce being commercially used in their own countries, scientists in the EU are not working in this field anymore. They're going to America. They're going elsewhere. Um, so... If you can, if in South Africa, where we can get commercial res, uh, re, uh, release, the government does uh, support our research. But if you're in Europe, you're not going to get scientists going to, you're going to get no research. If there's no commercial release, there's not going to be research. And those scientists are going to go into other fields or leave the country. And then what is very important is to have public-private collaborations. And the arrangement between our the, the grant that we've got from government is that the drought tolerant grant we've got is between the University of Cape Town and a seed company in Oto. Now, isn't that music to your ears? I mean that we can that both will benefit, both will benefit both the researchers at UCT and the people working in the seed company. Now that's what we want. So we have to have public-private collaborations. But without the government public support, of research, we're not going to get any crops that can be commercially released. So back to my book, GM crops, so and the global divide. What we're trying to do, what I've tried to do in this book is to update scientists, regulatory authorities and decision makers and the interested public on the current status of GM crops in both developed and developing countries. It gives first-hand accounts from people who are involved in growing, promoting, and regulating GM crops. Um, it's particularly important in the light of the current controversy how current countries should re uh, regulate the new gene-edited technologies. Now, I haven't even mentioned gene editing. Uh, this is the latest form. Uh, it's not really considered GM genetic modification, but if anybody in the audience would like to hear more about gene editing, I can I can tell you about that. But um, there is, uh, it's a new version of uh, how to improve crops in the lab. And um, so you can get it if you want. Now in this is, is quite a fun slide because <clears throat> early on when I'm, I joined the University of Cape Town from, from WITS where I, and the CSIR where I'd been working before, uh, I started working on, on maize and uh, one of my friends worked for the Sunday Times and he 
interviewed me for the lifestyle, which used to be, uh, be a, an insert in the Sunday Times. And here he's talking about me working on GM food, and, and he gives me the name of the Millie Lady, which those of you uh, in South Africa will understand. So thank you very much for your interest and participation. And I'm looking forward to questions. So feel free. Um, now we can move on to, let me see if I can just minimize this and get back to, there we go. So please, I'm ready for your questions. Oh, there is, what is GM in layman terms? GM stands for genetic modification or genetic engineering. And it's the way that we, uh, it is artificial, it's done in a laboratory, how we take a gene from, in my case, a resurrection plant and put it into maize to give it drought tolerance. So that's the layman's term. The next question from Judy Henry said, does acceptance of GM crops negatively interfere with the normal insect wildlife crop interaction and dependency? A very, very good question. I'm getting a bit dry. Let's look about insects. I'll never forget when we first in South Africa grew insect resistant uh, soybean. And a friend of mine who was looking at these in the, in the field, she said, they're, they're, we're growing GM um, soybean here and there's, there's non-GM soybean here. And obviously in the non-GM, they have to spray because they're insects and the insects will destroy the soybeans. But here, because they were, are insect resistant, you spray once when they are developing. And from then on, you don't have to spray at all. So she said, I'm walking through this GM the field of GM soybeans, and I've got all these little insects, the aphids and all the other beneficial insects, and they aren't harmed. But in the non-GM crop area, we, there's, it's sterile. There's not an insect to be seen. So from an insect point of view, um, could you put the question up again? I was uh, I, I just locked onto the um, wildlife. It's it's not these these the insect uh, um, the thing, the gene whose protein kills the insects has no harmful effect. It doesn't affect us. It doesn't affect books or. Um, lizards or anything else or fish or anything so it it does and 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 let me say something about um herbicide tolerant when when in the olden days before gm maize a farmer who was going to plant maize would have to first uh, allow the weeds to so he he would plow she would plow and let the weeds grow up and then spray to kill the weeds. And in those days, they weren't biodegradable. Uh, Roundup is biodegradable as well as being um, very much more specific. Um, so you'd have to wait until the spray dissipated. So that these are now empty fields, open to the wind and the rain. And so blow off this, the um, topsoil. Now, what you can do is let the maize grow up, let the weeds grow up together, and then spray them when they are small and doesn't do anything to the maize, but the weeds are killed and the weeds drop down and they form mulch. So you're, we call it no-till or minimal till because we don't, farmers now no longer have to till before they can plant their, their maize. And it means that there is topsoil is, is not being lost. So it's very beneficial. Next question. From what are the main issues raised by the anti-GM lobbyists? Is it religion? Yes, it can be religion. It's not God-given. But um, in agriculture, I mean, you know, people, let's look at the development of maize. Maize was developed in Mexico from a tiny little weed, it was a weed in those days, called teosinte grew about that big. It had a few little kernels, maybe tiny little kernels. But farmers, I think farmers are savvy. I think farmers are one of the savviest groups of people around. Farmers said, let's try and improve this. And so they crossed and they looked for the better uh, seeds. And eventually, Teosinto, over about, I don't know how many centuries, uh, developed into maize. 
So um, did God give us maize? God gave us tea sinta, I suppose. Or, or, you know, so so it's very difficult to to uh, counter on religious grounds. Um, no, I would say that the majority of the um, of the antis is that um, it's not beneficial so to consumers. So most of the first range of of uh, GM crops are good for farmers, as I said. In Africa, farmers are very often the consumers. But what we are now looking for are really good consumer benefits. So what we have in, 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 the, in the East is vitamin-enriched rice, and it's had huge problems because it's not natural. But what is natural in agriculture? So uh, you really have to... Um, Deep delve down into what people think is natural. And I have to say, very little in agriculture is natural. <clears throat> is the food we eat in SA genetically modified? Only maize. Maize is, is GM, and obviously any product that contain maize is as GM. So, in fact, South Africa has been one of the biggest experiments on the use of GMAs because there are farmers, Africans, who eat maize three times a day. And they've been doing that since 2008. Have they sprouted horns? I would eat it any day. But um, so, and there is um, GM soybean, but that's not a huge crop. So yes, 80 to 90% of the maize in South Africa is GM and has been. And, uh, and there was a thought that uh, it would impede uh, export. It's never had any problem. And we don't in South Africa separate GM and non-GM. So um, uh, do we export GM products to the EU? I'm not sure. Um, I, I honestly don't know. If, if South Africa exports to, to the EU. But um, we can certainly, I could look into that. I'm sorry, I don't know that at the moment. Ah, oh, that was the last question. Thank you very much for your interest and over back to Richard. Thank you very much. Well, that seems to have been the last question. So it concludes not only today's presentation, but those for 2021. Thank you very much indeed, Jennifer, giving us some of your time today for such a thought-provoking and interesting talk on what will always be a debate starter and subsequently polarising issue. Please keep an eye on our U3A Helderberg website from January for future developments, including notifications about talks commencing from the first Wednesday in February. Our own members will continue to receive emails advising them. Until then, goodbye, take care and best wishes from U3A Helderberg. <laughs>